This is uh, just us chilling before bed. Fireside chat after Fireside. a belly full of rice. <laughs> what did we What did we just eat? Szechuan. Szechuan. We had some. We had uh, fried pan fried vegetables with Szechuan sauce, and then we had uh, another pan of same vegetables with peanuts and kung, kung pao. pao. Man, the kung pao is worth it. I actually like the kung pao better. Yeah, like I thought you would. With the nuts, too. It's, yeah, yeah, the peanuts, it tastes really good. Yeah, that, that, I don't know why the crunch is like It's the texture. Have you ever heard about, like, you're, like, people um, are addicted to certain types of texture? Like, you have to have certain type, a number of crunch a day, a number of, like, thick, stuff huh. like that. I like, I feel like, um, like, my dad, he's, like, addicted to crunch. He's got to have, like, some form of, like, a chip. Some form of a nut, some type of crunch. I'm definitely addicted to the fizz. I need a you fizz. Like fizz, you need a fizz. I've just started that. Yeah, I've just like started lately. That. It's been mineral water. Yeah. Like it, when I'm in my unhealthy state, it's soda. So I wonder if we're on the topic of marketing, how much of that goes into the commercials, like the the sound uh, effects. That's probably a lot. Subconscious. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And the mmm on like a snack. Have you noticed that Coca-Cola has stopped advertising just their drink alone, but they've now, they're, they're, the way in which I perceive them advertising is that they are creating like something that goes along with food. So the way the oh, commercial starts, yeah. it's all about a burger or being at a picnic table or a big pizza. And everybody's just like it gathering around having fun this. and then yeah. like enjoy it with a Coke. So they could flipped it where it's not all about Coke. It's just something that's a complimentary. I have noticed that. That is interesting. Yeah. The, the worst are, and I think that like this hit the stride like in the mid two thousands, where the crazier you do, the the crazier it is, the more people remember it. But they oftentimes would happen, and then we talked about this in like some marketing classes. And then I graduated, and I haven't. I just talked about it with random people, but I love commercials. That's like when I got the marketing degree. Like I was. Well, your of, undergrad was business, and then you. My yeah. undergrad was marketing. Oh, and then your. Graduate was marketing. My graduate was international business, but yeah, we studied like macroeconomics and all the other countries and how the United States and just what they do to get the most out of their GDPR. Or, you know, gross domestic GDP. Sorry, G that's the GDPR. Gross domestic uh, product. product. Yeah, GDP. GDP. Yep. And so basically, how much? It was like a my degree was like a consortium of like. Some people say like they have an MBA and they do an emphasis and stuff like that, like an MBA with an emphasis in accounting or an MBA and an emphasis in marketing. Or in, it said international business, but really it was kind of like um, a business degree on steroids because they we had to do an accounting feature, we had to do finance. We didn't take a specific marketing class, but we had to take specific m economic classes, and then we had to do like quantitative methods and like regression analysis and like. Was it hard? It was difficult, <laughs> man. It was difficult. It was a lot more math than I use, right? Ah. But I was always attracted to why countries do certain things. Like I was always interested in like tariffs and trades. Uh -huh. Like, for instance, like to, at a, a United States level, right? What do you think as if Texas was to like divide itself away from the United States? What would their like biggest products that they would sell, right? Cowboy you, boots. Eat <laughs> that. Yeah, Ali G. <laughs> Uh, but beef. it would be beef, right? Do you think the same would exist in Washington State? Yeah. <laughs> Apples. Yeah, man. Yeah. Or coffee. Oh, oh, yeah. Nebraska, yeah. corn. Corn. So you think about that on a macro scale, right? Okay. China sells rice to um, all other countries in the world. So does India, right? And China's um, area of producing rice is shrinking because their population is growing, and so that's why they have high rices, right? Another something that's like interesting is because China's always been big in that trade, and so has India. Uh, you think they would hold it for forever, but Brazil has recently gotten into the rice game, and they started competing on a scale. And so all ah. this trade has gone on since the 1700s, like those spice boats and all that stuff. And so huh. the effects of all that is what I loved about the NBA. But the marketing stuff was cool because my favorite class was consumer behavior: why people make decisions that they do, oh, and it's like commercials topic. compel people, right? So, for instance, in like the mid two thousands, when people were in commercials, it was like all about drawing attention to the screen, and then you'd have like a little small excerpt about you'd remember the commercial, you'd tell your friend about the commercial, and be like, "Yeah, but what's the product?" He's like, "I'll remember," <laughs> <laughs> and that's I feel like that's still kind of a trend, but that really you know 
picked up in the mid two thousands, and I don't know why, but like, I was trying to think of a commercial I've seen like that. Like Old Spice is like a big have, time. Oh yeah, you, know, you find somebody on a beach, and then like the horse is running, and then the <laughs> horse's legs don't look the right, and then all of a sudden they're not on a beach. <laughs> You're yeah, like, what? Th- yeah, that's that. I think that has nothing that to do with the one. benefit of the product. It just has everything to do with the attention. Geico grabbing. is really good at it. Exactly. A lot. Yeah. I I think that I would say those type of commercials are brand building versus direct sales, where like uh, you're trying to get someone to buy the product immediately. You would be talking about the product. I would wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. It's like. Um, it, it tries to t- it tr- pulls on the emotional ties of something like hey if I buy Geico I'm kind of like it's hipper it's it's you more- trust Geico after seeing some goofy gecko talking about just whatever or some just like talking but, uh, about nothing related to insurance and then at the end like oh Geico can save you money on insurance fifteen percent fifteen minutes can save you fifteen percent they coined that term Wh- right? yeah which I I'm someone that switches insurances a lot because. The insurance world. I need like, to do that. I never switch insurance. Like the reason Geico says they can save you fifty percent is because pretty much every insurance company, whenever they have you as a com- customer, they'll raise it every year, every year. But they want new customers because the long term value of a customer is worth a lot to them. Mm-hmm. So they'll give you cheap first year insurance. So what I've started doing is like every year I'll just switch insurances and get that fifteen percent saved. And that's no not way. just Geico. That's like every insurance company okay so I'll search for new uh, insurance and what is crazy to me for especially auto insurance I know that one the most Jeez, I, I need to I need to switch I've been on yeah DSA for a long so time. they'll raise your insurance right every every year okay but th- what's crazy is they're raising your insurance but your car is devaluing. It's depreciating. They're depreciating, yeah. So you, the value of your car every year is going down. Makes no the, sense. The insurance is going up. It doesn't make any sense. So when you get quoted for a new auto policy, it's current it's state. Gonna, it's going to be less because the old companies are raising your price, and the new companies like, well, why would you, you know, why we're going to quote you for a, an older version of your car because it's older now. Correct. Uh, it's just crazy. So like. I've switched from you know Progressive to Geico to Nationwide and back to and I just like circle through them and just keep. It's kind of annoying to have to do that every year, but you know if it's gonna save me a hundred bucks a year. God. I mean, again, I'm efficient. <laughs> like, I need to do the these same are things thing. that I do. Just and I found. I sometimes like get so busy I just forget about it. And that's what that's, that's what, what they want. For. Yeah, that's why they give you the cheaper insurance that first year you just reminded me that i need to uh stop my renter's insurance because <laughs> oh, oh yeah my god i i I'm i forgot way. i moved I'm, like i've moved like three four times in the last five years or something crazy like i move a lot yeah and yeah i had i had the same thing like I, you got to remember to cancel your I gotta write that down. if you're not renting it the place that you're paying for renter's insurance. What like, the heck? They're not going to remind you. It's heck no, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. If you want to hear something funny about like, auto insurance and what it doesn't make any sense, I'm living in Colorado. I'm 8,000 feet above sea level, right? I literally can see mountains from my home, right? Uh-huh. There, are elk, there are elk in my neighborhood. There are elk. Okay. There's uh, um, like fox. There's like a lot of like, We've had bear in our front yard, right? Oh, so there are hazards out there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Have it on camera and everything. I pay a certain right. There's also a 45-foot incline of a driveway I could slide off with snow at any point in time, uh-huh. right? Dangerous. Dangerous. I move from Colorado to Texas, live in Brenham, Texas. USAA says, your insurance is going up. <laughs> and I said... What do you mean? I use all those same terms. Like, there's no elk in my yard. There's a regular driveway. Oh, you're close to Houston. I'm like, Brenda ain't close to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an hour and 15. They said, well, you're kind of, I said, I'm not in a floodplain. They go, yeah, but you're in this like zone that we created. Must be because of the flood. I, but like how. Or I mean, the hurricane. Right. Well, yeah. how crazy it is, is that? That is crazy. But. You know, the, the insurance, the way the market for the insurance works, I worked in insurance for a couple of years. 
I worked in like uh, I don't even remember the name, the type of insurance, but it's insurance for not for like normal the everyday person. It's more for like businesses, like yeah. Uh, but anyway, w I learned a lot about the insurance world when I worked there, and one of the things they do is they use the the law of large numbers. So, you know, if in this certain area, it could be 100, 200 miles of that of Houston or whatever because of the hurricanes and the floods and blah, blah, blah. Now, you know, they do it over a bunch of years. Again, the law of large numbers is like if they take a million people in your similar situation, out of that million people that own cars, how many of those cars are going to get you know total or something oh, okay um versus and that's the rate versus like oh me, me and you have a car uh, and we live in colorado both of our cars get in an accident oh you're 100 percent likely to get in an accident if you're 30 31 and live in colorado that's small numbers that's based on two people or you know us living in austin and brenham mm -hmm. and we've never had a wreck like okay a little zero percent chance of a wreck mm -hmm. you wouldn't the insurance companies don't base it off of that. They base it off large numbers. So, you know, over 20 years, if there's two floods in Houston and that totals a lot a of million money, they cars, had to cash it, out. Yeah, th that's probably why they take it in consideration like long term. Uh, this person is going to cost more. And because of the catastrophes of the hurricanes and stuff, they deem that uh, more likely for your car to be told and because there might be a higher propensity of a elk. payout we're going to can get more money for you to to save up for that payout at right. some point in time yeah because you're more risk there than the moose the same thing your car. But the, the, the thing that drives me crazy about insurance companies and i mean it's not speaking it's not like something a wild thought or anything but they want you to pay and pay on time and all this stuff but the minute that they got to pay out it's like laundry list of items as far as like what could minimize their payout. Yeah. And it just drives, it makes me think like there's a lot of collusion and BS on there. I'm but. not a big fan of the insurance mm -hmm. world. Like I get it, like why it exists, but especially insurances that you don't have to have, that you're not required to have, I'm really not a big fan of. Right. Because usually they're just up sales. Or, That's all it is. Or you, you fear, try to buy a car. Mongering. Yeah. A warranty. Yeah, the car. The car comes with a they warranty. They don't actually make much money on the car. They no. make money on the warranty that they scare you, you into. You bet. Don't even, doesn't even work when your car gets, like I had a warranty for my car. Uh, I had a new car. It was like a 2012 Civic. Yeah. Like a year or two later, I pulled out into the middle lane and was waiting to, to merge. Some person moved, uh, did the same thing, except they didn't look left. So they just kept driving at me in the middle lane until they ran it over my car. Basically, it ran over it. Like, it totaled my car. My car was like maybe a year old, right? And uh, so where was I going with this? Insurance. Yeah, insurance. So, like, I had a warranty for my car. Oh, yeah, But that just, like... No, nothing ha like basically I had a two-year warranty but because my car got totaled like my warranty didn't pay for anything my insurance paid for it so the warranty was just like wasted basically wow and if I would have paid up pay I got a very minimal warranty too but if I would have paid for one of the really expensive warranties like it would have just wasted money yeah and again that's like a one one excuse me like a one-off thing like if you look at large law of large numbers like the same me like you don't total your car in the first year or two in general but still those those upsells anytime someone's really pressuring you to like i know whenever i went and bought my car it was like oh here's a warranty it's going to be four thousand dollars or whatever yeah. they don't say that they say oh, it's only eighty dollars a month for 48 yes, years or whatever yes yes but and, the, and I'm like, no, I don't want that. And then they're like, they're like okay, well, here's one for 3000 Correct. Here's one for 2500 um, And I just, I literally, I was helping uh, Lizzie uh, try to buy a car recently. And I was like, I actually asked like to, so if I could speak to the dude and said, look, man, we can cut the chase. There's no warranty. Let's just sign for this car. Like, don't run the game, right? So it came with a manufacturer warranty. Uh -huh. And they want you to warrant up more money on this it's a scam it is crazy so like what I figured and you can tell me what your 
experience. It's been probably six years since I've ran ran through this. So when I was getting at my car, like you have the car dealership mm -hmm. uh, who sells the cars. You have a car salesman. Mm -hmm. They get a commission on their car. So they're wanting to sell you at the top price. Mm -hmm. But you can you can not knock it down. They'll not offer to knock it down for you, but you can mm -hmm. usually get it cheaper than that. Anyway, that's another subject. Um, but then they have a separate company who's the warranty company. That's correct. So like I talked to the car salesman. He sold me the car. And he's like, oh, here, come over to this other room. Yes. And then there's another salesman. And that's when they do the final transaction. They have finance and all that stuff come in. Here's your car, $12,000, okay, or fifteen, yeah. or whatever. Here, we got, we got all that. You're good. And here's, here's a here's warranty. Four, but now you need a warranty. Yeah, here's a $4,000 warranty. It covers you everything. You don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> it's the same exact I'm experience. Like, uh, no, I don't need it. Like, I'll tr try this one on for size. This is this one really like. But uh, sorry. What, oh, good, is good. this are you? Is what what is this what you did in this? It's situation? exactly yeah. the same experience. Exactly so the same basically, experience. they start four thousand. Okay, three thousand five hundred, three thousand, two thousand five hundred, and it's just, it's actually better value for you, the customer. You get more for your money the lo the more they wait. Correct. And then finally, that, and it's it might be best to not get any warranty, but they do have warranties after you say no a couple times. They're like, okay, okay, fine. Pay twenty five dollars a month to and get, get two thousand dollar warranty or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and get even the same warranty basically as before, or you know whatever. But yeah, it this is dude, really bad value. The first warranty they offer you really bad value. <laughs> this dude was relentless. But what was what drove me crazy about this dealership was that they this new car used new car okay. new car. They they knew what the market value was on online for this car. Okay. All right. And by, by the way, it's a Mazda CX-5, right? 2018. Okay. Right? They knew what it was selling. Let's say that the online price was $5.99 for like pretty much everybody across the nation. And they said, ooh, $5.99 is the going rate? We're going to like say our price is $4.88. Okay. It's kind of like, boy, it's going to catch a lot of eyes. Right. For the car? For the car. Uh, let's use a m more practical number. All right. So let's say the, the price was twenty five grand. Okay. And across the nation is like the average price Online. for this for this particular model too. For like the high end model with all leather or whatever, right? Twenty five grand. And let's say that they op uh, offered theirs at twenty three six. Like dang. You know, wow, fourteen hundred dollars cheap. That's cheap. just walk exactly, just walk in, less haggling. Maybe I can even get it for twenty three or whatever, right? Uh -huh. It's not my car or whatever. Uh, you, the experience is for everybody at this dealership, and I read reviews about it too. You walk in, and yeah, they let you test drive the car. You finally get down to brass tacks. You're in front of the salesman, puts out the paper. You say you don't want it for twenty three six. He says, okay, maybe I can work with you on twenty three. Do they do they do the thing where I'll be right back and talk to my manager? Oh, of course. What they is do, that? They do okay. Watch. Listen to this. We'll do it for twenty three three. Oh, how about twenty three? Okay, let's agree. Do you want this car for twenty three thousand? You're like, yes. And he goes, all right. Can I get a signature of your intent? Okay, sign it. Comes back and says, all right. He said we couldn't do it for twenty three, but we could do it for twenty three two. Right? Whatever. Meet in the middle. Yeah. yeah. And then this blew my mind. He goes. But here are some required costs that there's no negotiating on, and you have to have them. And one of them included a warranty, which I was like, no, frick no. But two of them, you, they would just put in shake, and I don't know what, I forget what they were, that's how like confusing it was, right? And so, <laughs> what ended up being the case was, their internet price was a lie. Because this were hidden, if you got really serious about moving forward with the uh, car, they were going to add these on anyway. So I told the I dude, agree. right? And listen, and listen, <laughs> I told the dude, I was like, no, no, no. So you're saying if this is where we're starting from, take our price, add these. That's higher than what your other dealerships are competing on. That's that's ridiculous. That we're starting ridiculous. from a different space. Like, I was like, wow, that's that's one of the worst car dealership things I've seen in a long that, time. Yeah, I get really uneasy when I feel like I'm being shammed at uh -huh. any place. I'm just like, walk oh. away. Just walk away. I have a I have a good car salesman story. So I bought the car 2012 new or 2010, mm -hmm. I don't remember. 
I think it was 2012. I think it was 2012. Yeah, because yeah, I, I think you still it. had your old car back when you graduated. Yeah. So I bought a new 2012 Honda Civic. Totaled it. I liked it. Yeah. I liked it, too. Totaled it. Got the money for it totaled. Um, bought a bought a bought a new new to me car, which this time I bought a used car because it was like, well, I can get a better car for the same price as. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, basically, I ended up getting the same model, but I got to upgrade it for about the same price because it was used car anyway. Cool. So I got a twenty thousand two two thousand and twelve Honda Accord, which is like the bigger model. Anyway, so one thing that was super interesting. So I I was I was. I kind of knew some of the sales tricks and whatnot. This time, I was buying a used car, um, but you could do this with any car. So, my little, my younger brother Drew, he had read this book, and I can't remember who it was by, but they had this, this really cool car buying tactic uh, that they talked about, where they basically make the car salesmen or the car dealerships slash car salesmen auction against each other so let me explain so i i'm just gonna explain what i did and this is exactly basically what the book said um so i went to to car dealership a found a used car i liked test drove it did the whole thing you know on the stickers say it's twelve thousand dollars or say it was fifteen thousand dollars well well i'll make you a deal I'll give it to you for fourteen thousand five hundred or whatever. yeah it's like all right, and I knew this this tactic, so I was like, okay, I'll I'll be back, and I went test drove next door, same type of car, is like the same model, different color, or whatever, different type of seats or whatever, but uh, say it was fourteen thousand, test drove it, I'll oh, we'll give it to you for thirteen five, oh, I'll be right, I'll be right back, let me think about it, so I go next door, and basically. You go next door over and over, and they find they figure out that you're test driving both cars. And um, I'm trying to remember exactly how. How, how did it you introduce them to? But so like, you I, say, I basically told them like, "There, that's cool." But this other I, I kind of played here? naive, but mm -hmm. I knew I was doing like. So, you say car dealership A. Um, let's see, how did it work? So I test drove one, and I was like. Oh, that's cool, but let me go make sure there's no other. Uh, I might want a different color or whatever mm -hmm. car of the same kind. So I went next door and test drove it. So it, they knew I was going back and forth. And then, uh, you know, as I'm walking out the door, that they, they would chase me like, oh, well, I'll give it to you for another $500 off before you leave or whatever. And I was like, oh, well, let me go test drive uh, one last time or whatever. So I go back and forth maybe two, three times. And as I'm doing this, they're getting lower and lower in their price, right? So originally they start five hundred dollars off ticket, and then a thousand, then fifteen hundred, and I got it for like, I ended up getting it for like three thousand dollars off of, of the sticker of price, the sticker price, which was like fifteen thousand. So I got it for like twelve. But anyway, uh, the final final move was like, oh, it's okay, it was just the air conditioner or the heater. Um, yeah, I can't remember it exactly, but basically I was like, I called the last person. Um, oh, I know the, the, so I was at car dealership B. Sorry, this is really confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I was at car dealership B and um, I, was, I knew I wanted car, the car from dealership B, right? Okay. Uh, and he set a price, say 13000 And I was like, uh, okay, but I think I might go next door and get the one for twelve thousand. Even though I like this one a little bit, bit better, that one's twelve thousand. So, I mean, I could do. Th so then I left, and and went went away um, back to A, and then called the guy at B again. I was like, I I really want your car, but they're offering me such a good deal over here. Like I could do it, I, I'll I, I'll buy it from you if you can do it for like twelve thousand or whatever. Just like deal. No. So like like thousand bucks off like that. So basically, you get them to bid against each other. So like they both started about fifteen thousand. Then you go next door and then, so I, I'm at A first, fifteen thousand. I'll give it to you for fourteen five. You go to the B, um, fourteen five. I'll give it to you for fourteen. 
and you go back to A, and then B's calling you, oh, I can do it for 13.5. And then you go back to B, and A's calling you, I can do it for 1,300. And you do that until they're finally like, well, I, I can't go any lower than 12.5 or whatever. And you did and that, and it worked. It worked. I, like, I, I saved literally like $3,000 on a $15,000 card. Got it down to like 12. That's five. fantastic. It was really cool. And like, I didn't feel bad about it because like that that's the game they play with you. So like, yeah. if they're going to play it with you, like you got to play it back. Absolutely. And so instead of them uh, basically jacking up the price to me, I, I got it down to the to a real price because... I mean, they're not going to sell it to you for a, a loss. No, ever. Um, so you get it down to the more reasonable price, the, the non-jacked up price. Yeah. You know, because they'll say, you know, retail is 18000 but we're selling it for 16000 mm. But retail is never what you sell anything for. Absolutely not. Yeah. What is retail price? Like, what is it? <laughs> Manufacturer suggested retail price, MSRP. It's just like a, a, That's a high number that no one ever sells It's called the Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price. That's what MSRP stands for. So if Chevrolet makes this truck, the man as a manufacturer, they suggest the retail price to be. X. Okay, that makes sense. So they'll they'll, they'll suggest thirty five thousand dollars. Yeah, and then it's up to but the dealership. Sell, sell it to the dealership for fifteen thousand, and then the dealership sells it for twenty, and then it's the manufacturer suggests a retail price, and they go, and the dealership goes, well, you know, we bought this car for X. But we're really gonna sell it for this, and we can. But they're we suggesting make, we sell it for this, so it looks yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. It makes exactly. Sense. Yeah, I actually, what's funny is I wonder what the actual cost. Is for, yeah, that's uh, interesting. And I think cars. with my, that method I use, it's basically like trying to figure that out. Because again, mm. if the MSRP is thirty five thousand, but the dealership pays fifteen thousand for it, and the dealership lists it for twenty five thousand, mm. you know, you have ten thousand dollars to work with. Jeez. Those are made up numbers. But, yeah. But you can go back and forth and call around and say, hey, I, you know, I can get it for twenty three thousand over mm -hmm. here, or I can get it for twenty two thousand over here. Mm -hmm. And eventually they'll be like, no, I can't sell it to you for that. Like I would lose money. <laughs> the car, the car business is really. I I haven't dove into it. I know it's a lot of fun to shop cars, and the test drive. And, yeah. yeah, and it's also because the internet's been become so pervasive. It's also kind of like difficult for car dealerships to compete because these you can get on Auto Trader now and go. It's not seventy five miles radius. It's nationwide. You can find a car in Chicago, Illinois. This way, it's the same car that you you know that you're searching for in Dallas, Texas, or Austin, Texas, and then go. That's like three thousand dollar difference. I'm just gonna fly up there and get it, come back. But you never never know what it's gonna be. Yeah, you know? that so, is interesting. Yeah, I never really like doing big ticket shopping like that. Like it's always kind of feels kind of scummy. Like especially with the the warranty stuff, and it's just like. That stuff kind of stresses me you know, out. It's it definitely is. stresses me out. It's Car just like shopping, it's such a house it's, shopping. Mm. I've never bought a house, but I've shopped for a house. Like, and I realized how nice it was to have an apartment to where you don't have to worry about anything. All this stuff. God, man. Fixing your air conditioner. Like we had our air conditioner go out here in the middle of summer. And it was I remember like, that. I oh, came. Was I was awful. over here. Oh yeah. I was over here. Y'all had like a black. Oh. It's like trash bags everywhere trying to. It was horrible. Yeah. And. Yeah, but but I mean, I didn't have to worry about paying a thousand dollars to get it fixed. No, my buddy had a, a his air conditioner bust. He'd been in his house for fourteen years. His air, his air conditioner busted eight thousand dollars in Colorado. Eight thousand oh. dollars and get Jeez. this. When he was trying to save up to like, he had his he his family and him survived without air conditioning for two weeks. <laughs> so he had him in a hotel for a couple of days and came back and we're like just going to power through. It's the middle of summer in Colorado. Jeez. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he loses his job. And he finds another job. Like he, he gets severance pay, right? Uh -huh. So they're like, sorry, you know, you're laid off or whatever. Here, here's money for a new air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to give you three months of pay, but you have no more pay coming in. It's yeah. all crap. So he found a job. And he, luckily he found the job before the severance pay ran out. So that was like a bonus for him to pay for their but it's a budget buster dude yeah it's crazy. you gotta have a big emergency fund for right your house stuff. right and yeah man what are your thoughts on the houses like oh i just uh, that's my new it's kind of like my new thing now because i just got into it so where are you with it like are you pro buying house or not very pro and what's the reason for that for you for me 
All right. Um, all right. So teach their own first off, right? Because uh -huh. a lot of people, there's a lot of research right now that says like millennials are less, there's a high, le, there's a less rate of millennials buying houses than ever before, right? As far as young people coming up, okay. it has to do with a lot of like uh, debt out of college, right? Makes sense. It has to do with the fact that housing prices are getting crazy, right? In a lot of the metro areas that these people are moving to to get jobs, uh -huh. be it Seattle, Denver, Austin, whatever. I mean, I don't know if you heard, but Apple's expanding. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right down the road from here, they're it's building a new, what, billion dollar? B billion dollar sale. investment, 533 acre campus, 5,000 <laughs> people initially. They want to raise it to 15,000. Their Apple's going to become the largest private employer in Austin, Texas. Wow. That's going to be crazy, right? Yeah. We already have uh, numbers. <laughs> so NASA thinks There's a crazy. long way of saying why I'm pro, but California companies are coming to Texas like crazy right now. There's an article oh. that Lizzie sent me that 18, over 1,800 companies oh, are moving sorry. from California to Texas just because it's like tax friendly and all this stuff, right? Ah. And I'm a big believer and it, it does take some time, but I'm a big believer in like, okay, if you're going to earn money, right, help the best ways to help make your money work for you is to invest in things where your money can be used and something that it will go up in value. So I'm, I'm a big believer in like, if you can't afford it, try to buy somewhere that maybe the home value will be better in five years or whatever, right? So you're looking at it as an investment. As an investment play. That's the only, that's one of the main reasons I see. Like, I think of, so you, everybody's got to like, well, if you're trying to retire, you have like some form of a retirement account or whatever, right? Again, teach their own. But I think the biggest investment you make in your life, theoretically, is a house, right? Because I've heard, oh, I, I am of the opinion, I think you are too, like no debt is a good way to live, right? right. Yeah. And you live within your means. But like really the, the only significant debt you should really take on in your life, unless you can save up, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right, is, is for a house. So some of this stuff that I saw when I was looking for a house, which has been like three years now ago, probably when I was really kind of researching it and looking, was that houses lately, and I don't know what lately means, maybe like the last 10 years or something, whatever, mm -hmm. they haven't been raising in value more than, than uh, either inflation or something like an equivalent investment, say just buying stocks or whatever. So um, what are your thoughts on owning a house if it actually, just pretend world, if it isn't actually a, a good investment, like it's an okay investment, but not a good investment. Do you, are you still pro house in the sense that you have your own space, you can do a garden or whatever? Okay, like, what so, so, okay so beyond just like, let's say you're lucky enough to buy a house where it does go up in value over the course of 5, 10, 15 years, right? That's great. Good for you. Uh -huh. Lucky. Let's say you live in an area where you buy a house and it doesn't go up in value as you expected. There's one other component that's a little bit different that I'm, that's the reason why I'm pro houses. For the past 10, 15 years that you've been spending apartment money, let's say your rent is $700 a month. Multiply that by 12 then multiply that by the number of years. That amount of money is gone from a leasing or a renting perspective. That amount of money that you put into a house, from a principal standpoint, is there. Got it. So it's equity. That's the only reason. So it's equity. So if it doesn't go up, if it stays the exact same in value, you've built up equity for 10 years that you can either use so as I a guess yeah. Okay. Mm. Sorry if you had more. No, I mean, but the thing is, is and here's the here's the rub, right? Because I I've thought about this a lot. Like for instance, living in Denver, it was. I mean, it makes me want to cuss. It's all about supply and demand. The law of supply and demand. If there is a high demand for housing, and there's low supply, that means housing prices are going to be through the roof. That also means rent. If you're just renting, is going to be the through through the roof. And if and this is what they're saying in a lot of metros. If rent is just as high as house, then obviously go for the house. You're going to create re equity. But it used to be, back in the U.S., that hey, if you choose to buy a house, good for you, chap. Way to go, right? Go get some equity. Do your thing. But 
if you if you want to eventually be there, you could rent and you could save up because rent was so low. So we're living in a day and era where like that's kind of it's a gray area now. Like you know people are charging eighteen hundred dollars a month for apartments. Well, crap, a mortgage could be eleven hundred dollars a month, right? So you have to pick and choose. Like okay, what do you want to do? Like if you can find a, a way of getting by, meaning and renting an apartment that's cost it's minimal cost then do that and you have like your whole world in front of you where you can pick how you want to allocate your money right but if rent is squishing you to a point where it's the same then i would say maybe opt for the house kind of thing let let's do a make believe scenario yeah um so we we rent a house i mean we rent an apartment 1200 bucks a month we buy a house 1200 bucks a month for, what's the average, like 20, 30 years? 30 year mortgage, 20 year mortgage, yeah. yeah let's say 30 years, mm. I don't know. 360 payments, yeah. Let's say it's the same monthly payment um, as the house as it is an apartment. Mm -hmm. Let's just, well, first of all, what kind of cost do you see going into um, a house that you wouldn't have in an apartment? So first of all, uh, mowing and Taking mm -hmm. care of the lawn or mm -hmm. whatever. So you're going to, let's, let's talk about the basic things that are similar and then we'll cut off, right? Okay. So house and apartment, you got to pay for electricity. Maybe your house okay. is a little bit bigger than your apartment, so you pay a little bit more. So utilities. Yeah. Ma maybe and utilities. Internet, yep. Yeah. But internet are going to be there gonna both ways. That. They're going to be very similar. Right. Water, depending on, are you hosting a lot? Do you have a lot of guests? Are you... Do you have roommates? Like, you, I mean, let's how say that would be the same. Same. Right? Okay, so water is going to be somewhat similar. Assuming you have the same size apartment. Uh, right, right, whatever. right. House, whatever. Right, and then um, real quick, do you think you get, you probably get a bigger house than you do an apartment, paying the same monthly. Yeah, life? everything is relative. It's all about location. So I'm just pointing that out because, like, let's say same location. Uh, say, say we're talking about. Uh, this apartment. This is a fun conversation. It I love is. this. Yeah, I love this, this is stuff. interesting. Uh, this say this, this apartment, and then there's a house across the street. Okay. Two bedroom. We pay, both paying twelve hundred dollars a month for this apartment and the house across the street. We'd probably get a bigger house, right? Square foot wise. Yeah, because think about this. And, right. and yard, and you'd have a yard. Exactly. Check out. Um, check but out. But with that, your utilities will be. A percentage higher each month because of that, right? Thank so we do have to cal calculate that. Yeah, yeah. Well, put this in perspective. Okay. You're paying twelve hundred dollars a month. We're, obviously, there's differences between your twelve hundred dollar payment could be, you know, six hundred or seven hundred dollars principal, two hundred dollars loan, one hundred dollars HOA, you know, a uh, hundred fifty dollars insurance. You know, so you have to pay for things above. The principal and loan amount that you don't have to pay in apartments that are different. So now we're right? breaking off. To so the now debt. we're breaking off. Okay. Yeah, but twelve hundred dollar payment over the course of thirty years that equals a four hundred thirty thousand dollar house, right? Okay. Like that's what that's what twelve hundred times 30, 30, uh, 360 is. So yeah, absolutely. To your point, an example, twelve hundred dollar monthly payment is going to be able to buy, provide a lot more than just a two bedroom, two bath apartment or whatever. Okay. Maybe, let's break down maybe. Uh, Here's things that you have to worry about though. Like I was about to say, yeah, let's break it down to easy like pluses for owning a house and then minuses for owning Okay, a house. so let's start with. Compared let's, to apartment living. Let's start with minuses. Or renting. Just All right, if you rent, you pay a, a certain amount of money a month and that does not change for a rent unless it goes up. Yeah, every like here year. It, it's been, it, go, it seems like it might go up every year. So. Right, so. Right, um, you okay? You do not have to pay for you. You maybe your renter's insurance if you want to get renter's insurance, right? Or a certain yeah, we pay for the okay. insurance. It's probably lower than a house than yeah. a housing insurance, right? Most likely. And okay, with a house, you pay taxes on the land, right? Pay taxes on everything. Or, yeah, so but not when you're apartment or not when you're renting, correct? Correct. So right. that's another good yeah. thing for renting. If you're renting, you don't have to pay homeowner's insurance. Yep. You don't have to pay for... Yeah, pay, you have to pay renters usually, but would you say that homeowners are probably more expensive? I'm sure. Yeah, it's Way more be, expensive. Yeah. Way more expensive. 
I would get. I figured out the answer as I was asking. I was like, of course. Yeah, <laughs> homeowners insurance. If you are renting, you do not have to pay for taxes on an annual basis or worry about taxes going up. Oh, that's taxes. That's the concept of gentrification. What's happening in Denver? What's happening in Austin? People have been living in Austin city limits for 30, 40, 50 plus years. Calvin, they yeah. haven't done any improvements on their home. They haven't done any landscaping. Um, their home value is just going through the roof because they're so close to all these cool areas in Austin. Uh huh. And the tax district has said. You're living in a really, really nice neighborhood because of the location to all these restaurants and fun oh, bars. So the taxes so are going up. But the, val the home value goes up, and maybe the taxes go up because the home value goes up. 2.2% of a $200,000 house is way less than 2.2% of a $700,000 house. And what if they deem your house worth $700,000 just based off the land it's on? Well, I don't have a house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's just... And that, that then tells those people, well, I can't afford, what, think about this. Think about you go on a 30 year mortgage. It's a fixed mortgage rate, meaning you have the same interest for 30 years. Okay. And you're like, okay, I can afford this. It's $1,200 a month, everything included. My, my payback for the loan uh, in, a, in combination with the interest, because every time you get a loan, you pay the principal, which is the amount that the house value is plus the interest on which the loan. right now is probably what like four to five four to five yeah percent. depending on your credit score yeah four to five percent 2019 four to five percent for a 30-year mortgage 30-year yeah it, I would say anywhere between probably because the feds are raising it it's probably between 4.5 and 7 depending upon your credit score right okay. it used to be like when Pat first bought his home way back in the day with Chelsea his first home you could get like for three real cheap three point two five percent interest, right? Because it just hit a low. Yeah, so. they go it goes like this. <laughs> yeah, about every seven years is what I. Yeah. One of the books, I, one of the few books I've read, that was one of the coolest things. Was like, you know, over seven years, it will go from like, you know, seven percent home and auto interest rates, and then they go down, to uh, two or two or so, and then the, the run up. Federal Reserve decides, oh, we need more money in the system or whatever, it goes up or. Exactly. However, however Economy's works, stronger. Yeah. Let's raise the interest rates. When the economy is low, let's get people to buy into these low interest rates, right? So, so when we need people to buy stuff, we lower the interest rates. Mm -hmm. When we need them to, they, to slow down the, <laughs> the economy, we raise them so that people won't buy as much. And it's a strong economy, and maybe they have more money to do it. I don't know. And and the re another reason to do that is like to help protect the value of the dollar, right? Is that kind of... It does. I never it, really understood quite... Uh, the... F I, hey, look, if uh, if you and I understood it, our podcast would be through the roof. <laughs> Here's how the, yeah, yeah. Here's how the federal The government. Fed, I mean, so people right, that... We'll get back to home sense. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, I'm just saying, like, people that study this for 30 years don't understand what sometimes what the Fed does. You know what yeah. I mean? Sometimes the Fed is a guessing game. Like, Ben Bernanke wrote that book who was managing the financial crisis. I mean, they're mathematicians, but they're making calculated assumptions on how it's gonna affect the economy. That's right? interesting. When, when I was really big into the stock market, which was like from like 2000, 2010 to 2015, mm -hmm. um, and we used to talk about this all the time, like that was our thing yeah. back in 2010 was like the stocks. Hell yeah. You and I were just learning stocks and like we were studying it all the time. I was reading books about it. I hardly ever read books. Um, I was reading books about the stock market. We learned a lot. And that was one of the things is like, like they were a, a lot of the stock people was like, oh, the Federal Reserve is about to make their announcement, and so like that they had a huge impact on the stock market based on, oh, we might raise rates or we might lower rates and we might keep them the same. And it was always a big deal when the Federal Reserve Absolutely. came out and said their stuff. Um, but yeah, like I, I know it's important, but again, kind of like what you said, we. I don't really understand it. I mean, I understand on a very basic level. But right. Right. Uh, what but was that's it? interesting that they go through all the math. They probably use a bunch of math and guesswork to try to figure out how their decisions are going to impact the economy. Well, I mean, what was it? What was that term used in the mid two thousands? Um, oh, it was like a made up word that like spoke. It, it, the term meant federal injection of money. It was like social, like monetary easing. 
something easy. Do you remember that? That sounds familiar. Well, what was it? It was such a bullshit word. <laughs> well, that's very easy. Fiscal easing, Federal yeah. Reserve. Oh, hold on, this is gonna this is gonna blow. My... <laughs> Quantitative easing. <laughs> that that sounds Quantitative familiar. easing, also known as large scale asset purchases, is an expansionary monetary policy whereby a central bank buys predetermined amounts of government bonds or other financial assets in order to stimulate the economy and increase liquidity. Quantitative easing. I do remember, uh, can you remind me if this was part of the the quantitative easing? easing, easing? Mm. Um, Like in 2009 maybe, maybe Christmas time or something, the the government just like gave people like a thousand bucks to stimulate the economy, economy or something. Do I don't remember, remember that? that, but I, I believe you. But I don't it, remember. It might that. not have been a thousand, but it was several hundred bucks at least. And it was like, they're like, go buy stuff, to like to boost the economy. Like it was like you Dude. literally got a check in the mail. It was like, here, go buy stuff. Dude. And it was back when you know the economy was crap. Like, oh yeah, it was the worst. Yeah. You want, so while we're on like macro. Um, Monetary policy and everything like that. You want to know the coolest things I, I heard from a podcast one time? Yeah. It was the history of how the Brazil, Brazil Real came to be about. Their currency that they use. Okay. All right. The Brazil... Um, it, Brazil's currency used to be based on the United States dollar. Okay. The United States dollar used to be backed by gold. For whatever reason... Isn't it still? It's not. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was in the 80s when they were... Some Are you serious? It was an what? economic crisis. They pulled it off of gold, and it wrecked Brazil's economy. Wrecked it. So much so that inflation went through the roof. People, like, they really didn't know how to, like, really tighten in and understand how like, to, uh, to normalize the economy. And you know what they did? What? It was... It's, it's an amazing story. There should be, like, a movie about it, in my opinion, because I was like, what? Like, what? Netflix. There was, uh, an economic, uh, <laughs> there was an economist who uh-huh. got together and they said the only way to normalize our economy is to help create a fictitious currency. Bitcoin. So, <laughs> kind of like that. But real but, life Bitcoin. But they called it the real, like the real currency. And people would get, they would earn reals based on certain work. And I don't remember how it all came to be about, but as there was a competitive currency in the market, things started to normalize and they eventually just transferred wow. over to the real and the real became the basic and only known. Wow, and I was that's like, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And meanwhile, we still have like countries like in Africa where it cost them $20 like dollars to go buy a banana or a bread, right? And so that's why they, they print like million dollar bills in certain, that's when inflation gets out of control, right? And that's what wow. the, that's what um, our Federal Reserve was trying to help with. Also a fun fact about the Federal Reserve, it was only created, wait, what was, how's, the year that the Federal Reserve was created was the year that the IRS was created. Huh. So as soon as the Federal Reserve came about and they would be able to print money, an organization, a side organization was created to collect money. You know, and, 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 I know, and maybe my brain works weird in this way, but when I think about that, at a, think about this. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Okay. So you know how, like, when you, we used to watch medieval shows. Okay. And a bunch of peasants everywhere in the kingdom. And this is just how my brain works. Because I, I, I actually I feel like I want to write like a short story or like uh, something about this. Because I talked about this at the uh, Christmas dinner this year, right, with my family. I feel like we're still living just to the world. And he's crazy over here. But I still feel like we're living with kings and pawns. Okay. All right, I'll give you an example. Peasants used to have to pay taxes to the kingdom. Right? That's a common theme. Right. right? Do we not have to pay taxes? <laughs> I got it. Yeah. And do we all live in, do we not like 
get the same type of opportunities that like the rich get in in America, right? Where wealthy families still marry wealthy families, and kings still try to anoint their kin to other kingdoms around the world, like. Literally, like, the rich only get richer, and the poor sometimes get poor. There's a class divide going on in, in, in America where, where I think that education is rising and becoming almost unattainable for people. Otherwise, they have to, like, if they want to attain it, then they have to go in massive forms of debt. And who gets rich off of massive forms of debt, right? There's, like, I, I just feel like there's a... Who, who gets rich off of masses? Mass. Financial institutions that collect the interest. And who owns financial institutions? The rich of the rich. So I feel like it's, it's, I feel like there's almost like a game going on. And I know that sounds like weird in conspiracy theory, but I feel like there's still a pawn to king relationship between the rich of the rich and the poor of the poor. I would say it's definitely way more likely for poor to get rich and poor to, to move up than, you know, medieval times by quite a lot I would get I would think especially with the internet coming about and giving everybody a, a chance to do whatever on there I mean I would say it's a rarity I would say that the amount of people that have random success of 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 internet junkies like recurrent term millionaires that that is not the norm my oh, argu yeah, my I would, my, my argument that. would yeah. say that they are an anomaly, and that's a that's a really great story to highlight. But if you look at the masses, I feel like you are your financial wealth over your time has to do with yes, you would work hard, but there is still a glass ceiling, right? Up to you can work hard, but you'll never be like yacht status with this guy who was born in a in an East Coast family. Who grew up learning three different languages, and his parents put him to prep school, and he went and became, you know, like like went to Harvard or went to an Ivy League school, and then because of his network with an Ivy League school, he has a bunch of friends that got him uh, jobs at another company that in, they just keep on earning more, more money, and it's based on what they're exposed to. Versus some kid in Akron, Ohio, who grows up, works hard, and ends up owning like a small car dealership, right? I just feel like there's a weird. There's a class divide. Like, if, if you grow, who you grow up around, kind of puts puts you in a position of like how much wealth you're gonna have in life. Not that it matters, but I feel like you are more of a proponent of your environment and who you know than than what you know is more is more important in that aspect. Maybe I I don't know if I've thought enough about this to. Give my opinion. So. Yeah, I'm sorry to get not go down a rabbit hole. No, yeah, it's right. weird. So you think owning a house is good? <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! I, this is like this should have been recorded. <laughs> this guy's gonna like post him like, who the hell is this dude? No, but like I don't. I, oh man, yeah. I actually have gone like I've done a lot of like thinking about it, and the reason one of the reasons why is I don't see a lot of women in the tech industry. Nor do I see a lot of African Americans or Hispanics. I see a lot of Indians, right, in the tech industry and stuff like that. But I, I mean, I remember going to, sheesh, nothing against, let's just say a company that, that starts with micro and ends with soft or whatever, right, that, you know <laughs> what I mean? Or a company, I just remember walking the halls and I don't see that many ethnicities. And, I, and what, what started happening in my mind was like, oh my God. And this is what this is what sort of made me think. I'm like, okay, this stuff is this. Maybe this stuff isn't crazy, but I probably shouldn't talk about it to everybody. <laughs> you don't have to. No. <laughs> <laughs> but think about this: Harvard was created in 16, 1600s. Really? Yeah, well before the United States was developed. Harvard was created before the United States was by developed. The, it was created by the Native Americans. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't Jamestown created in 1664, right? That's the, <laughs> History that's the is not my okay. strong suit. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't even know what happened last week. Yeah. So the United States was founded in 1776, right? But Jamestown was, was the first town in the United States in Virginia and was established well before 1776. And then education system was based on um, 
the Bible, right? And like a lot of universities have like a Christian background because that's how you evangelize education. You would learn how to read so you could read the Bible, right? But Harvard was created well before that. People, think about this, old money, people were getting their undergrad, masters, or doctoral degrees in the 16s and 1700s. So when you talk about old money, people that come from a line of their ancestors who had doctoral degrees and just college degrees dating back to the 1700s, fast forward to 2018, think about how, like for my family, my dad was the first guy to ever go to college in his entire family. Put that next to somebody whose family has gone to college since 1710. And think about the people that they have grown up and interacted with and all the opportunities, right? Over the course of 200 years, that's going to make a lot of difference in your genetic makeup as well as... I think someone like you will be way more hungrier than that person, though. I agree. And I think that's a huge advantage. I agree. But here's where, like, I'm, like, here's where I'm stifled. Maybe you can help me. There's research that if you grow up with less, you work harder for more, just like we're saying. Okay. Right? Like like you and I, we probably didn't get all of the gifts that maybe we wanted at Christmas time. Probably didn't always get like our favorite like branded shoes or shirts or whatever, right? I will say that I, I, I mean our family wasn't rich, but I would say that Christmas time I was pretty spoiled. You were pretty spoiled? Okay. But I will also say that me as a person, I actually don't like, I don't actually really like gifts. Nor do I. As far as like, I like, I like a gift if it means like, hey, I like you and I care about you, so I'm getting you it's this. It's the sentiment and the sentiment thought. Sentiment and the thought. Yeah. More, but a gift as in like, hey, I'm getting you this because you want it. I don't actually like that because I didn't, I don't feel like I earned it. I don't feel like I did anything. I actually I agreed. Like so, I have, I grew up around people that, God, this is like really sad. I, I never wrote down a list. Uh, maybe like beyond the age of ten, and I actually would feel guilty if like, you know, I would. I had friends who were in their mid twenties where their parents would call them and say, "Hey, what do you want for Christmas?" And that just that question just makes me feel icky. That's like the most disgusting thing. Like. No, 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 my parents don't do that. They haven't asked me. They've never really asked me what I wanted. I've only just gotten what they did, what they could provide, right? But what I noticed is I, I didn't grow up with getting everything I actually kind of like sometimes desired, right? Which instills some type of uh, good understanding that, look, money doesn't grow on trees, and you got to work hard for it. And if you want something, save up, put some effort into it, and go get it if that's what you want to do, Right? And there's research that, you know, kids that are just given everything, they don't understand where it comes from. But their parents had to work hard for it. So whose side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> are you on the side of the kid that, that didn't get much growing up? Or the family, the kid that came from the family that's been going to school since the 1600s? No, I, I'm just talking, I'm obviously on the side of the kid that didn't grow up much with much, right? Uh -huh. But what I'm talking about, do we're talking they about two different, different advantages. We're talking about two different things though. Yeah. Two different things. You 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 inserted work ethic, right? And how somebody could be hungrier. Uh-huh. I say to that absolutely and agree up to a certain point. There will never be We definitely like there's never going to be If you're working hard and not smart, it's definitely like kind of pointless. You're just right. a hamster on a wheel. Even if you go out and get all the education that mankind can get, I still feel like there's a class divide of people that money will make money and you will never be where other people will be. And that's why I think it's important that you don't put all your, um, all your thoughts into putting value on like financial goods, right? And finding happiness in that. But I, it just, it's astounding to me how people that maybe live, try to live the American dream, will always be stifled by a glass ceiling versus others that are born into something. And because you're born into something, you will you know, rise based on your network of your family. Meaning it's more about who you know, not what you know. I think I don't think about this topic 
enough to even give good. Like I don't even know what to really say. Okay. So sorry. No, you, you don't need to be sorry. I just I feel like it's becoming a one way conversation. I I feel like I want to participate, but I just don't know how. Okay. And I I don't want to just BS stuff out of my head and not really. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, you're good. I just I'm just expressing that so that we can try to find something different that we can both discuss. Because I, I just feel like I'm not able to participate and I feel kind of bad that I'm not participating. I'm sorry, okay. No, no well, you're good. To break down the house thing, right, for me, when I think about buying a house, I think about is it, is there, uh, can you find an apartment at a way lesser rate and are you able to save money to do things that you want to do in life or that you want to like save up to spend money on and if you can't if you're in a position where rent is just as much as a house then I obviously the easy decision is go into a house but if you go into a house you have to consider the added cost beyond just the rent so let's say your rent in an apartment is $800 and that you're you could get a mortgage right I throw your mortgage for $900 well, that's not equal because your $900 mortgage only covers the cost of your home, the principal and the interest associated with it. It doesn't, cost, it doesn't cover your $120 a month for homeowner's insurance. So now, instead of $900, and now it's $1,020. $200 lawnmower. And you, you, you how about, you how about, fix how about not even like those variables, but how about just another form of like your monthly payment? How about a $250 in addition to your principal and interest and your uh, homeowner's insurance, insurance two hundred dollars to cover your taxes. I w so that nine hundred dollars then soon blooms up to fourteen hundred dollars a month just to cover your basic living, like just to cover like the ability to walk into your house. It doesn't cover electricity, utilities, any of that stuff. So all that stuff starts to balloon up. I will say this about the renting versus buying. Growing up, I was way more. Uh, I guess mainstream, I don't know what to call it, but like, I wanna go to college, and then I wanna get married to mm -hmm. a high school or college sweetheart, and then I wanna have a family and have, you know, a house. The older I get, I'm 31 now, the more I realize uh, how much I've moved since I left college. I've, mm -hmm. I mean, growing up, I was in the same house from, from age zero to 18. Went to college, was there, four year five years made a victory lap yeah baby <laughs> go crew <laughs> <laughs> national champs <laughs> yeah um but since then man i have moved like i don't i don't even know like i honestly i'll have to count it in my head probably seven times in 10 years mm. or something like i've moved a lot and Some noticing that yeah it's changing jobs you know chasing love mm -hmm. that didn't work leaving going mm -hmm. you know back and forth here or there I like Austin, I'll go back to work somewhere else, come back to Austin, you know, whatever. Um, you know, but if I'm in a house and I bought, a house is not, a, in my opinion, a good liquid investment. Like, liquid being, I can't buy a house and then make profit off of it within a year feasibly. I know there's people out there that do it. I know you can flip houses. Mm -hmm. But like for someone that just buys a house, in a place that you want to live and then it happened to go up in that year it could very well go down in a year you know correct pri prices fluctuate a lot with a house so for someone like me who's moving who's agile in a sense that my life's kind of not very predictable as i would have thought it would be when i was younger you know i move a lot i, I do you know owning a house for me sounds like probably not a smart thing but for someone that uh, knows they want to be in this spot and they're going to work at the same job for until retirement, maybe it is. Like, I think I, I don't know. I think you bring up a good point. The only reason you would probably want to get a house is if you know that you're going to be in an area for a minimum. I say a minimum ten. I say a minimum of three. I say a minimum of three years, because after two, you can sell it, right? And yeah, it depends whether it goes up or not. But the taxes are going to be then good the enough. Realtor cut, you know, that's another thing. Right, right. 
And but if you know you're going to be somewhere for like three years, and if you want to be there, maybe some people's some people's minimum is five, some people's minimum is ten, whatever. I right? Pulled that out. Of yeah, but like it it is a it's not meant to be a short term investment like you're alluding to. It's meant to be I'm stable. I know I want to be around this area. Okay, let me sink my teeth and let me create some roots. Right? Let me get into a community, or whatever. Right? And and maybe the the house purchase could be for a lot of different things. It could be that I want more bedrooms so I could host, or I want that garden. Right? I want a piece of property so I can create a garden, or I want a backyard for my dog. Right? Or I want a backyard for my daughter. Or it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But it definitely, in my opinion, is for a longer term investment. Let's uh let's give our thoughts about not what we think is a good or bad investment, but what currently you and I both think is best for ourselves and why. Yeah. I, do you think that kind of is? That'd be easy. That'd be you, easy. You want to go or me? Yeah. Uh, you go first. Yeah. All right. You're so, nomadic. So yeah, I, I mean, I didn't think I would be as nomadic as I am, but I'm definitely, since I was, you know, left college at the age of 22 or 20, however old I was, mm -hmm. I've been nomadic. Like mm -hmm. moving a lot, and for me, the more I, I'm in an apartment, I sometimes, you know, depending on the apartment complex, sometimes I feel like maybe I was in like a, a, a safer feeling apart, or not so much safe, but just like more welcoming. I guess is a good word. Yep, so I've yep. lived in several apartment complexes where it's just like. You know, everyone, all the people head down. And like, oh, God, yeah. You know, and it's just, it doesn't feel very welcoming. But I think for me, if I was, if I could find a nice apartment complex that had, you know, a welcoming feel and it was more community driven versus like, I'm here to go to my hole and don't talk to me kind of thing. Like, that's not very fun. Um, but I'm sure there's neighborhoods like that too. So. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I've really enjoyed not, like, I lived with my older brother for, about two years and he had a house at the time and you know neither of us wanted to mow like once a week twice a week or right whatever. and like living in an apartment I love not having to worry about any of the, the no yard chores and not because I'm lazy or anything but like I just I want to spend my time doing other things like creating and mm -hmm. you know when you're having to mow your lawn every, once or twice a week you can't do that or when you're having to fix your own air conditioner instead of like sending a maintenance request like it's very different so for me I have really enjoyed the the nice like not really having to worry about whether things are falling apart and just kind of living my own life um, and knowing that like hey if I need to move I can either cut my lease and pay a, a fee or what I've done in the past is just live there a couple more months and then move or you know whatever it's not like I feel like oh crap I bought this house for two hundred thousand dollars now it's worth 185 maybe I should live here for another year and see if it goes up or, right um, so yeah that that has been nice for me but again growing up I would have thought oh, I want to live in a house and then move up in my in the job I work at until I retire and then retire but now I'm like I've actually been retired two different times in my life, like for a year to two years. Retired being like, I, I don't work at a job, I saved up enough money through investing okay. that I was able to support myself for eight months, eight months one time and then t two years the next. Okay. And during those times, I was trying to start my own businesses. I started them, but didn't become financially self-sufficient off of those. Yep. But again, I was retired and during that time, when I, was lazy and not working uh -huh. and it turned into me just being like retired wanting to hang out with people everyone's working and I know when like you're older and you retire and other people are retired it's yeah. probably different but for me I did not like it I did not like not having something to do every day right so for me um, I, I like working I like working I don't like 40 hour a week jobs where you feel like you work and when you're off you sleep or mm -hmm. rest. I've worked in, in places that felt like that. It's like, oh, you, you go to work and then the weekend's yours, but you just want to rest. That's no fun. Um, I'm kind of going on a tangent, but back to the house thing. 
Yeah, I went on. I went on my tangent. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't really know how to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> now we know each other felt. <laughs> it just goes to show that you turn on the camera, you get to talking. You might just start talking about what you want to talk about. <laughs> Both on our soapbox here. Yeah, no, it. but it's, uh, it's crazy. Why don't you like the 40-hour week? Uh, Tell me a little bit more about that. I just feel... Do you feel like you could ever work on a 40-hour week, John? I personally feel I could work 80 hours a week if I, I was, like, the boss of my own company and doing projects that were fun to me. Okay versus working 40 hours a week for a boss that is, just does not care about you and just completely devalues your work. Um, and quite frankly, you could give a shit about the work yourself. Yeah, it's just like entering stuff into a computer, like stuff anyone could do, like yeah, just whatever. Um, but as far as like the average 40 hour a week job, I just, I don't think I would like the monotony. Um, the one forty hour, well, anyway, <laughs> I, I don't like the monotony. I don't feel like, oh, I'm just gonna do this repetitive thing for thirty years, retire, and then live my life. Like I personally, I've had when I was retired for that for two years when I was starting Streamline Gaming, uh, my website where I teach people how to make and sell their board games. During that time, I hired someone part time. She would work 20 or so hours a week with me. I worked so much during that time, like on that project. I worked with her. I would work with her in the morning. She would get done. I, I would work. I'd go out with Nassus to the river. We'd swim. I'd come back at night, and I'd work, mm -hmm. get up, and do it again. And it was that, that was like the fun part of my life was that work. Right. So I could do that like 80 hours a week. 100 hours a week because that's fun to me. That's, I'm getting to make the decisions. I'm getting to be creative and mm -hmm. use what I've learned versus 40 hours a week, do this this way. You mm -hmm. can't do anything different because mm -hmm. this is how we've done it. Where for is that years. report at that yeah. I asked for? And just like, yeah, I get, like that's. You just, had a bad experience with it. Well, and, and just, I don't particularly like having a boss in general. Okay. Uh, maybe that's just like the entrepreneurial in me or the creator in me or I don't know what it is but I don't I don't like being told what to do <laughs> and not not like in a rude way like I'm you know um, which is probably to tie it back to the house thing probably a reason I wouldn't want to own a house because then I feel stuck I feel tied to that house oh okay like I can't I feel less agile I can't uh Make a decision like, oh, uh, I want to work on this project, but I need to be in Denver for this because that's where oh, the, the okay. whatever that, you know, what, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for me, apartment is what I would like. Yeah. Or yeah. renting. It doesn't even have to be an apartment. So maybe, actually, man, this is so cool because discussing this, like the, the having a, a yard and maybe like a little more space to myself, maybe... If I had enough money, maybe I could rent a house and then just hire people for the the maintenance and all, or like the, or maybe, I don't know, when you rent a house, I guess sometimes the mowing's included. Sometimes. Or, so maybe I could look for that and I'd have more room for us and then I wouldn't have to worry about. Directing uh, down three steps. Neighbors and. Uh, yeah. I mean, I again, I think my ideal is like a nice apartment complex, nice being one that has welcoming neighbors. I want to have, I'm going to put a twist into this. Yeah, this is fun. What if you could get the best of both worlds? Oh, yeah, I'll come live with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not, not what you're asking? That too, that too. <laughs> okay, what, yeah, what yeah. is my movement day? Uh, We're going to move in with mm -hmm. Uncle Justin. Yeah, what if, <laughs> what if you could live in an apartment-like setting where there's people all around. Uh huh. Instead of the third floor, you're on the first floor, right? Maybe like you have like a little small little backyard with a sliding glass door or whatever. And yet, instead of just paying rent, you pay about the same amount of money, but you own that apartment. Oh, so uh, condo. 
Yeah, still probably no, because I would feel not agile. Okay, so that's I, the biggest point. I guess, yeah, I guess what that's we're coming to. the biggest point is, is, what is, the, I mean, that's what they, that's what you get to arrive on. You, high, now, ticket in the, high ticket purchase, I guess. High ticket purchase, nomadic, you want to be able to be nomadic. All right, let me ask you this. That was a good question. Yeah. How likely is it that you will move to a different city in the next three to five years? If your brothers New are still here. I definitely see, I love living with my little brother, which is where I'm at right now. Yeah. Been living with him since January. Um, I don't, I love Austin. I don't, honestly, you know how your mind thinks like, I want to live here, 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 or whatever. Like you start thinking about different places yeah. to move. I love Austin when, too. I when, actually would like to I live here. When I wasn't in Austin, I was dreaming of living in Austin. Now that I'm in Austin, I'm still dreaming of living in Austin. Though that's a big I, deal. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. But I do still dream of moving uh, like to different parts of Austin that might be more friendly and welcoming. So Ooh. I do what see... If you found, what if you found the th top three areas that you want to live and you found a house that was reasonable that you could buy and you would have almost the best of both worlds? Because you, you, to me, you sound like somebody that doesn't... Uh, this is just you and me talking, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it doesn't sound like you really want to pick up and move to Salt Lake, Utah, or Denver, Colorado, or Seattle, Washington, or Orlando, Florida. It sounds yeah, like you I are going to be like in the same. near to my family. So the nomadic thing. I mean, I guess what I'm what I'm hearing. Oh, from, good point. So Maybe it's, it's just I like change. I like I don't like the monotony. Ex that's what I'm getting. At. I'm really trying to break you week. down in the sense of like it's not that you're going to move away from Austin, Texas. It's this. I think you have an aversion of getting yourself sunken into an area where like you can't, if you wanted to just move around. I definitely, when I'm at a place for too long, I think I definitely feel too long being for me, like maybe 10 to 14 months. Like, okay. Even if I'm enjoying it, I feel like you need a change. I need a change. Cause like, it's just, I think I get like, Whenever something becomes repetitive, when I feel like mm. well, I did this the last eight days, like mm. I need I need to change something up, and so I need to eat Szechuan instead of Kung Pao. Yeah. <laughs> so that uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I think it's important. I'm glad that we're talking about this. This yeah. is really like self-revealing and, and neat to. So I think being self-aware is really important for your career. Oh my gosh, yeah. For your life. For like to for dictate me, how you live each day. Man, this last year, I'm, I have made so much progress in the self-awareness cool. field. Like, I, I'm super happy that I've focused on that this past year, especially since February. I've really been trying to figure out who I am, like, what I want in life. Not just for me, but for those around me. And trying to make it happen. Taking some, you know, scary, for me, scary steps. Changing jobs, changing the place I live, trying something. Me too. Maybe I won't have enough money to Same. put it to work. You know, just different stuff. But that is kind of it's living. Like, yeah, yeah. That's to me is living. Like, oh, maybe it, like there's a chance. There's a chance me being a pickleball and tennis coach in two or three months won't work out in a sense that I won't have enough clients and I'll have to find a new job. Mm -hmm. That's a very possible it's a thing. Real, it's a real Just like, thing. And with my websites, with my personal brand, there's a very high likelihood that I keep losing money every month ev or you know, every year trying to build these websites and build my brand. But to me, it's me being creative. It's me being me. Mm -hmm. And that's worth the risk. Like For all the money I've, I've spent more than I've, pay than I've gotten, and all the time I've spent into it, you know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of time. It's a lot of money into my creative projects. But, you know, seeing little remnants of success from those projects have been awesome. And it's success for me, like the financial success is nice. And I'm not, I'm still definitely in the red. Like I definitely spent way more money than I've, than I've made. Mm -hmm. But like a little financial uh tip here and there is nice like oh maybe some of the hard work is paying off but even more so for me is like people messaging me and this doesn't happen a lot 
like when I started, I was like, oh, in a couple of years, everybody will message me, like, uh, you know, asking questions. It doesn't happen a lot at all, but when it does happen, like, oh, your video helped me learn how to do X, Y, Z. That's really cool. That's what I bet you it, makes my day. Yeah. And that's effort on that person's part because I bet you there's a lot more people that look at the video, like, oh, watch it, cool. you know, watch it, and they, it helps them, but they just never make the comment. Yeah. You know what I mean? So all those comments, man, it just, it keeps me kind of going and like, oh, maybe it is help. Maybe the stuff that I'm doing is helpful and is worth mm. my time. And I think over the next 10 years that that will play out and it will, you know, it'll help me towards my life goal of helping 100,000 more people in a positive and significant way so you're saying through my creativity and caringness and competitiveness you know me being me maybe you need to buy a house with a pickleball acreage <laughs> no 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 i no. okay i will tell you this i have thought about if i had the money uh-huh. buying a facility okay that had basketball Ooh. tennis pickleball i love it and I like, would want to, oh. And I just coach Calvin. Just, I coach, like, whatever I want to coach, I coach there. Put this on record, December 30th. Justin will be an investor in that. 100%. Thanks. 100%. I, like, I'm, I, I don't usually. I've always wanted to own a facility, too. That'd and be give so back. Cool. It's like a rec center. How I cool don't be usually, to have uh, like, you know, uh, brag about myself. I'm yeah. usually pretty modest, but. I think I'm, uh, I would say I'm a very good coach. I think that's one of my, I would, my, my, you talents. don't even have to, Coach Callie is a good coach. I know that. I know that. That's based on, you know, the feedback I get from students, the, the return rate of students. You're just a really good listener, too. And you're careful with people's yeah, personalities. Yeah, but no. <laughs> yeah, but no. Yeah, shut up. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, listener. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I, I get panicky when someone compliments me. I got to no. work on that. Go ahead and try it again. What I was saying before I got rudely interrupted. <laughs> no, I mean, like, you just care. Like, you take the time. You're a good analyzer of a situation, in my opinion. Like, you're um, you're probably more on the end of listen, observe, and then figure out what to do with somebody versus just Here's how asserting. Done. Yeah. I will tell you this, I genuinely care. No. I, I really do, especially when students. And when I'm working with someone, uh, coaching them or helping them, or just talking to someone really, if they're into it, like like those students I have that want to be there, they want to learn mm-hmm. tennis, they want to learn pickleball, they want to learn basketball, whatever the sport is that I'm coaching at the time. When they want to be there, that's like my oxygen. I love being in that moment, dude. What, helping them. What about like creating? Sorry, this is probably like weird for like no, the camera angle and everything like right. that. But have you ever thought about uh, creating like a facility that runs camps? That would be cool. Like another way, way off the uh, the house topic, but <laughs> we'll get back to it. Think about like the answer for me is I want to rent. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. But we also broke down why Calvin wants to. And rent. I think that was important. Yeah. And that was I again self awareness. I think yeah. it's huge. So thanks for helping with that. Likewise, I, I'll I'll finish off my my answer here soon. But a facility that that reinvents kind of the ways in which kids are reached. And that sounds really bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like I've been I've brainstormed these things like. What I, kind of summer camps where kids are out of school? Like, what are they doing? You know what I mean? To kind of keep them out of trouble. I went to a camp called Kids Express. It was awesome. Cost my parents probably on an arm and a leg to put me in there, but they wanted me to go on field trips, right? They wanted me to stay active in the summer and be challenged and then have some areas where you go, I can play basketball inside a court or go to the cafeteria to get some food, whatever, right? But I was active. And I want the same, that, same for that for, for Jules, but I also want, like, to help a community kind of thing you know what I mean like for me a big a big population that I'm interested in is people with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities okay. I've worked in that field for eight years or however long yeah since 2008 I've taken some years off here and there but how do some you want of my best friends them? in the world or have intellectual disabilities okay. developmental disabilities I was 
honestly, I can say this. At the beginning of this year, in January, or maybe it was early February, or whatever, uh, I was I coached a uh, Special Olympics team, and we, we were out of Elgin, uh, where I was working at the time, and I had been coaching them to prep them for you know 10 months leading up to this tournament. And then we had the tournament, we go in the tournament, and you know the story, like, there's 10 divisions. We were in the eighth division, one of the lowest divisions. Okay. But we had been working so hard, and our, our facility wasn't big, so pretty much whoever wanted to play was playing. Yeah. And I had them sign up. I had them, you know, commit to practicing for the event, so if they didn't practice a certain amount. It's like, I, it was very, it was, I made it, like, like a basketball team. Absolutely. Like, like what we practice, would do. you're going to play. You don't show up to right. practice, you're not going to play. Whatever experience we had in high school that was so fun, like I wanted to replicate that for them minus the, you know. The yelling. The, the, yeah, the abuse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, what are we talking about? There was no abuse uh, in <laughs> high school sports in Texas. <laughs> yeah. well, minus the abuse, I wanted to replicate <laughs> that abuse. experience for yeah. the players. And I, the, I can tell you, I know for a fact that was most of their that made most of their years. And I know it made mine. Whenever we were done, so our team had, our division had three teams in it, eighth division out of 10. We win the bronze medal. Yeah, of so course. Three out of three. Yeah, exactly. After the podium, my guys and uh, ladies, that all the athletes on our team were pumped. My assistant coach, who also had an intellectual disability, awards me with coach of the year. Oh, Coach Calvin. Yeah. And man, that just made my life. Yeah. And I was like, I want to, I want to do this. Like, I want to coach every day if I can, or what? You know, th- it, it was awesome. And so from then on, as I continued working there, I kind of got burnt out in the day to day. People stopped wanting to play basketball. It was hot. This, that, the other. You need a new influx of kids. You know, that's why they, that's why the kids cycle through. For coaching too. Yeah, I, so I stopped coaching there because no one really wanted to play and just whatever happened there, you know. Um, but I was like, man, and I, I noticed I was burnt out because I started looking for jobs and I noticed mm. all these jobs I'm looking for are coaching jobs. Like, I think I want to coach, you know. Yeah. Like, so I, I just went out on a limb and I'd been playing pickleball and, t- and tennis at the Austin Tennis and Pickleball Center and Finally went up to the the guy that ran it, Lincoln, who I'd talked to a bit, just just as a you know as me a customer going to play there, and then finally I was like, hey, you know I've coached tennis before, can I coach here? And you know within like a month or so, I was out there coaching, and it it's been amazing. So awesome. chasing that dream was really cool, and again, a lot of it started with me coaching that Special Olympics team. And I'm hoping to coach them again this year. Even though I don't live there, I'm hoping I get to go out, mm-hmm. coach them. You know, there'll be a new energy for it. They've, they've been all out of practice for a while, so maybe they'll be wanting to play again. And again, if people are into it and they're wanting to be there, I love coaching. When they're not, and there's a lot of kids. That's that hard. Their, their parents make them go or whatever, and they'll just literally just, just not do anything. They'll just, like, stand there, and it's so frustrating. Okay. But... Man, I do. I, I love coaching people that want to learn and, and better themselves. Have you ever thought about going into a coaching job like for a school or for any of that I stuff? I think I have thought about it. I definitely would guess that I prefer, again, it's the whole boss thing. Like at yeah, a school, I don't. There's a structure and a hierarchy. You know, I don't stuff. think I would do, do well. You know what I see you uh, bringing like really good at too is like if you had a facility right being a being in charge of some leagues like you know hosting I'm planning pickleball leagues. like this is interesting i lincoln the, the guy that owns the tennis center pickleball center he asked me when i first started like oh you can organize leagues i was like i don't think that's me you know like i don't and here i am you know i kind of got this pickleball tournament thrown on me but as i've done it you know it's not it has, it's been kind of fulfilling kind in a of, sense that I'm helping other people get to compete and meet yeah. new people. Like, it's kind of You could almost turn it into, nice. like, the, a hot tournament in Austin, right? Yeah. I mean, flyers at, like, you know, pubs downtown, it's it's accessible. People can come out, like... And as you say about the leagues, like, we're probably going to play in leagues next year, and I'll be running them, and where at first that was kind of, like, terrifying. Like, I just want to coach part of coaching is kind of 
I think a part of what I like about coaching is introducing new players to each other and helping them find people that they're compatible with or playing a sport. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of satisfying for me because I kind of become matchmaker for athletes getting to, not romantically, but just, you know, you know when you, have, when you have someone that's a really good player and someone that's a really bad player, they probably won't like playing together. But when you can help some people that are kind of on the same level level introduce up to, yeah. to each other and then they become friends, like that that feels good to me. <laughs> I don't yeah. Know. It's part yeah. of the helping 100,000 more people. But again, we said this off camera. I want to say on camera. All right. Um, so the helping 100,000 or more people in a positive and significant way for me sounds kind of like, oh, wow, Calvin, you're so great. You know, like mm. that. it kind of has that vibe, which uh, for me, I was telling you, it's kind of like a selfish thing in that I've noticed over my lifetime when I'm nice to someone, in general, they are going to be nice back or on average, they will be more nice than they you know, than if I'm neutral or, you know, mean, of course, they're not going to be nice, but I've noticed this, and I think if I just live the way that I would want other people to live around me, then that will rub off on people the same way that a negative person will rub off on someone. It makes sense, right? Very much so. So, I'm really trying to do that, like, and create Calvin stop being an asshole at grocery stores <laughs> he's really start being a turd on the court you know <laughs> no I haven't wait what oh. wait what oh you said I've stopped yeah I've tried to stop being, <laughs> I still my competitiveness gets me on the court sometimes I bet it I, does I'm not gonna lie I bet it I does am, I am way better with it you but don't break rackets I will, anymore <laughs> I will not lie I do get I still I mean that's just the competitor, in, yeah. competitor in me. When I when I'm losing, you know, it's just you know how it is. You're a competitor. Oh yeah, I hate losing. It's it doesn't matter how. So well, I can I do better with the social games, but when it's a competitive match and like maybe the person I'm playing against is kind of my rival, it hurts, man. Oh, of even course. when you're just playing for fun, like oh. it hurts. Oh, of course, of course. And that I don't think that'll ever get out of my system, which is why you know again I've noticed this. I'm not going to get rid of that competitiveness in me, so I'm going to embrace it and mm -hmm. help others, you know, learn how to be healthy competitive versus mm -hmm. unhealthy competitive, you mm -hmm. know, throwing stuff and breaking relationships because of a game, which I've done. Have you? Speci well, especially when I was a kid, I mean. Tell me, a little, tell us a story about that. Oh, man, you should have seen me just so mad at my grandma when she beat me in video game baseball. No. I love my grandma. If you've seen the po heard the podcast, seen the video, she is like, she's like everything. Everything, to me, to right? You, yeah. She's taught me creativity, everything. I lost it when she beat me in in uh, whatever the baseball simulator three thousand Nintendo game, and she never beat me again. Pro and not because she couldn't, I'm sure, but because I acted like such a devil child. For like, reals. I cried. I it was probably I don't remember exactly, but man, I hated losing. Yeah. But uh, where do you think that started from, though? Just that's a good question. This is an eight. I think it's my little man syndrome. Mm. Like, you know, I, I'm alpha male. Like, I just am. Yeah. And I may be like calm and nice, but. I'm Roger alpha. that. I'm alpha male right there, Roger. That. I know you are. Like we butted. Yeah. And yeah. I know it. Like yeah. it's, and I think it's really cool that you and I, two alphas, are. I so think we close. had three alphas in the house because Pat's oh, an alpha, oh, Pat's an alpha male. Our college house. Jeez, that was full of alphas. Just three alphas. <laughs> that was three alpha males, dude. And we made it work. Oh yeah, because we all respected each other for what we brought. Yeah. That was cool. That's really yeah. cool. Target market was my <laughs> contribution. <laughs> Pat's was... I guess we were never really... <laughs> like, we all had the same goals. We never really, like... I w we w never really wanted the same things. We're so all we in never... our different swim lanes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Mm. You know, Pat was going somewhat ministry, and then he, he always seemed to take the coolest courses. It's <laughs> like... <laughs> He was in kayaking or his adventure fact, racing. God, they're kayaking like, You're together. doing what in college? He's like, oh, dude, I just <laughs> took a triathlon class. <laughs> like, what? That was so great. I loved college with y'all. Yeah. 
Me uh, too. But it was it's interesting because each one of us, in my own opinion, right, like had <coughs> had like had our own way of coping with that alpha male kind of mentality. Right? I mean, yeah. But like if Pat plays a game, he'll tell you now, he's like, Man, I'm gonna get I'm getting older and you know, things it's not but as soon as he gets in, he's going to try. He, he, remember how gassed he was in the first two plays because he went so hard? <laughs> like, calm down. Yeah, man. we don't really have two levels when it comes to competing. No. It's like, you go until you die. Yes. Like, and intramurals, man, we were so competitive. Do you remember that how was, soccer, so how, how hard it was? Because, like, we couldn't affect the game as much in soccer as we uh, wanted to. Well, but, and we played the championship four on five or whatever it was. I don't remember that. Tell me. We. I don't remember that. We Dude, we had some like some we were pretty one good one or two of our our players they couldn't make it they had to study or what work or I don't know what but we still almost won and that kind of broke our intramural championship because we had one streak, football, football basketball we had one basketball for two years in a row yeah or whatever it's true and, and then the soccer and then we just we couldn't do it in the soccer we came up a goal short or something we were down a player but. Ah, don't get me started. <laughs> oh <No>, my god! <laughs> and no, but Calvin's the, grandma could hear him from there. <laughs> my grandma's ears perked up. It's like, uh oh, Calvin's upset. I forgot. Did you know that? Like, I got injured in soccer. Um, senior was it junior or senior year? I think it was junior year when Pat and I were living in that other house, and you would come over to visit all the time. Right? <laughs> Remember that? No, that was so a lot funny. of fun. I remember, our favorite time, like my favorite time, was like when you would show up unexpectedly. Like, yeah, Calvin's here. <laughs> And then I leave unexpectedly. Yeah, and then you're like, oh, where'd Calvin go? But then I get mad at Halo. Yeah. Oh, was, those. Talk about, we butted heads geez, on that. Oh, man. Jeez. I did not accept losing in oh, Halo Oh, my well. God, no. The the best was, I knew I was the worst at Halo amongst all four of you, amongst <laughs> all of us. It was you. It was always between David and Pat, who's going to be second and third. And I was always the one. When <laughs> I lost, I was out. <laughs> <laughs> because David made it so competitive too, because all the crap he would talk, right? It was fun though. Like it was so fun. I it was remember fun for making... all of y'all because I was <laughs> I was losing. <laughs> I was just the guy that was like, okay, Justin's gonna play. <laughs> so what made that uh, something interesting that about that time of our life was that was one of the best times in my life, and what it consisted of was. You know, going to some fun art classes for me or whatever, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so being creative, and then being competitive, doing the intramural stuff with you and my, you know, Pat, and my good yeah. friends, uh, and then you know, just basic, simple life stuff. We didn't have no worries hardly, in the world, like no, yeah, and no, basically no money. We were in oh, college. Oh God, no. So w I remember just like What's the thing Pat, Pat showed us his his meal. And it was one tortilla, a piece of cheese on a like ham. George Foreman grill, and one piece of ham. Yeah. And he's like, and then he rolled up, and you eat it, <laughs> and like we might have dipped it in something or whatever, and and it was just like the best. Mind blowing. Time. Yeah. It's like the the most simple, most enjoyable it's a thing. It's it's a quesadilla, people. You put you heat up a stove <laughs> top. Butter. Yeah, a little bit of butter. Put the tortilla in. Put some. Put the ham down. Put some shredded cheese all around. Oh. And then once it heats up, you fold it over. So simple. And then you turn so it good. over. <laughs> <laughs> and and not just like I could eat that now and it'd still be good. I still eat but, it. But what made it so it was just like us sharing that together yeah. and like us just like that's what we had, and yeah. it was more about the just like David Orsai would come over and bring over the bean dip and Fritos. <laughs> 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 that was good times. And you're right. <laughs> and to that point, you don't need you don't need a lot to be happy. You're right. So when we talk about a house apartment, there's not like a sense of like going after. Uh, money or going after like financial means it's just it's a difference in where people are maybe even in their life like for instance for me I have a little one now right and I've got to think about it's not just my future but it's you know my daughter's future and you know it's it's weird like how the brain works like you become a parent you instantly like think about what you had and you kind of like well, maybe I want to show something new to my daughter that I never got a chance to have, right? And so I grew up with friends that always had, like, a little bit of land here and there. You can just, you know, build a bonfire uh. or, like, do or go explore or, you know, that they got to be one to host their friends over and go explore together on these little trails like and all that stuff. I the, the rent or own 
Yeah. Okay. And That's so where I where I'm at in my life is I know that my daughter's going to be in a certain town and going to grow up in a certain district to maybe so you're gonna right be there. So I'm going to be there and be a part of her life and maybe what I want to give to her is like a little house on a little piece of land, right? Like and yeah. And you know maybe with that she gets to see different animals grow up in in that land too. Maybe she gets a little goat, right? Maybe we have a little like miniature horse or a donkey and she, you know we name it something and it's fun for her maybe she gets a pig I, maybe we have chickens i don't know do whatever yeah, yeah whatever you want but you can't have a pig i can't bring a pig in this apartment you could have a small little miniature pig you can yeah they make they have miniature pigs. in the apartment i don't think they allow it certain certain apartments do mm. i know certain apartments allow rabbits so i'm still on the rent <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. bring my pet pig mm. I'm absolutely obsessed with these pigs that don't grow any more than 20 pounds. They're like mini pigs. Is that like legit or is that that's, like... That's legit. But I mean but legit there being are, like... There are some scans out there where they say, this is one of those. And, and then you then get boom, it. Boom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Within Gosh. a week. <laughs> yeah, you already named it. You're not going to give it up, right? <laughs> no, the kids love it. From a car salesman. Exactly. <laughs> that's the Insurance. pig rate. <laughs> no, no, no offense to the car salesman. None, none whatsoever. Yeah. But... but that's one of the things where my, where my mind is at, like, okay, I do want to, I know where I'm going to be. Maybe it's not even where I want to be, but I'm going to be there. And I want to create something for Jules that maybe I didn't get to have. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I get to give her everything she wants. And I also, right. like, that's I've a been, good point. I, I want to teach my daughter. So, for instance, one of the things that's on my mind, Jules is 18 months old, right? By five years old, I want her to know how to make dinner for the family. What I mean by that is, it's not hard to make dinner. We were just talking about how easy it is to flip a quesadilla, right? Uh -huh. I want her to be able to like learn, how, know how to like open up a can of soup, turn on the burner to like medium or low, pour it in, you know, take two pieces of bu uh, bread, put some butter on them, put them down, put a slice of cheese, make some grilled cheese and soup, you know. And do it safely and securely, and that to me empowers her to go. Sorry, that I just like that was such a dad meal. Yeah, that was awesome. I loved it though. But like, yeah, it is a dad meal. But like, that is no, it's a perfect. But I, it comes from a conversation I was having uh, with a professor at Colorado oh. Christian University, who got her PhD when she had three kids, and they were all under the age of fifteen. I was like, wow, how do you do impressive. that? How do you do and that? Working. And she said, how I did it was each day of the week somebody was assigned to make dinner for the family. So whether it was her five-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old, or the husband, they had to own that day of the week for dinner. And it was their responsibility. And I was like, that is empowering. That's, that's that life is skills. Cool. Nobody, you don't go to school and-, and That's empowering versus- Oh, oh I know I, I can do algebra. That. I didn't have that, so I'm gonna give you all of that. Right. Instead of, I'm gonna give you the resources to be able to do all this. Te knowledge is power, man. That's and that's cool. and that's what I really want to focus on, like as far as a parent is like not. And they talked about um, have you ever heard of this lawn mowing parent um, mentality? Lawn mowing parent. That's what they're calling it. Lawn mowing. Where parents. the child sits on the. <laughs> well, they say like anything that gets in the way, they just mow it over. Oh. Any roadblocks. I was thinking it's more literal, like the kids that sit on their parents' lap when they mow the lawn, <laughs> no. they bond. Right, right. Oh, they, oh that's the helicopter parents. Opposite. Yeah, helicopter parents, like the ones that are all circulating around. All right, so lawn mower is what again? They always move out all of the roadblocks ah. that are in front of the kid. So the, the kid, kid never gets life is easy. Correct. Yeah. Like to the point of. A kid forgets their water bottle that they love, and they can't go a day of school without it, and the parent has to take off of work, go home, go pick up that special water bottle. Like, you have to... I definitely you see have, that. You it? have to go through stuff to understand, one, it's not all about you all the time, and two, like, that's what life is. It's about overcoming challenges, right? And like, that's what, like, all the podcasts we've been, like, or I've been talk telling you about is, like, Seeking challenges and overcoming and accomplishing things. And that's how when you said you wanted, you were retired, but you still wanted to do something, that's innate in human nature. Progress. And you have to accomplish that. something. I have a sense of accomplishment. That's I definitely what, have that. That's what fuels people to, to continue to be positive about themselves internally within your own inner voice. And I want to instill a good work ethic for my daughter, but also like 
I want her to be exposed to certain experiences that maybe is like a kindling or a spark to something that she wants to pursue. Like I want her to know where vegetables come from. So I want to grow some with her, right? I want her to know that's how... And you want to own that land. And y- that. Yeah, and I want her to know like, hey, you know, maybe sometimes if you want to do something in life, you got to get your hands dirty and do it yourself. You can't always pay for somebody to do something, you know? Because that came from a different generation where people back in the day... I want a watermelon. Okay, let's grow Let's, let's grow watermelons. Or I want, a, I want some pumpkins. Let's get a pumpkin patch. You know, and that's, for me, is a, a, a bonding agent for my daughter, too, right? Because I'm teaching her something that maybe I'm teaching myself at the same time. Yeah. But it'll help us be on a project well, let's together. let figure it out. It's a project. It's a father-daughter project, right? And so that's some of the things that I have in mind, and that's why I want to pursue that right now, right? If I didn't have a kid, I'd be out there. I love Jules. I can't imagine life without her. But if I didn't have a kid, maybe I wouldn't be living in this country, you know? Maybe I would go and, go and live in Costa Rica or something like that where I don't have to earn a lot of money and I can live, you know? Like, that's that's where I'm at. Maybe that'll happen someday where, you know, I have a little bungalow in Costa Rica and you just come down and visit and work on projects together and go that to the beach. neighboring bungalows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. That's a bucket list of mine. I've always wanted to, like, own a small little, like, little something outside of the United States where, like, friends and I can just go and just whatever. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think we're being summoned. I think so, too. Is it past your time to go walk and get a treat? Oh, <laughs> this head. Walk? <laughs> walk? All right. We'll end our podcast, okay? Yeah. Dude, that was that was fun. Again. That was good. I like the, the laid back, just us talking. Yeah, and I feel like, you know... Um, if we get into a topic like that when I started, <laughs> no, I, I had no problem with it. it. I just didn't like, yeah, you know, I felt like I was just watching the conversation, right? As opposed to, right. Um, but I, I mean, it's fun just talking. Like it is. We got a, we got a lot of interesting topics, and in, you know, car buying cars. I think that's kind of pretty practical for people out there. We can also uh, do a little bit better job of like refining it and getting to like, okay, here's your five reasons why you want to buy. Here's your five reasons why you don't as far as house and apartment too. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, this definitely brings up, you know, I definitely want to think about this more and research it even just for myself because yeah. I should probably uh, figure out what I want in life. And like what we kind of discovered here is maybe it's not so much me buying or renting, it's me wanting to be mobile and what's you know right what what's really underlying there you know so. it starts get like you know what gets me thinking about something really cool and like your minimalist per, uh, personality which i i mean if i didn't have a if i didn't have jewels i would probably be more so in your headspace yeah is this you getting now stick with me here and you may you may say oh no that's, that's not for me i think uh, oh the tiny house Ooh. So you have you mobile have, house that you own, right? It's basically you, think about this. There's a there's a log cabin manufacturer. Oh shoot, there's a log cabin manufacturer out in up northeast, like in Ohio, that I almost bought. Okay, for twenty eight thousand dollars, which is not a crazy lot for a home. Right. Brand new. <laughs> comes fully uh with a kitchen, sink, uh storage area, tables. A place for a mattress up top, like a mattress up top. There is a built-in fridge. Everything you need, 300 square feet. So 300 square feet, that's all you have. And it's a log cabin. And all you need is a, a car or a truck to pull it. You can live anywhere in your... Wow. Anywhere. That's cool. You can go to any national park, hook it up. It's a mobile cat log cabin. I'll show you online here in a bit. I am obsessed. Good night, everybody. Good night.